This is CBC Here and Now. It's a bit disheartening and discouraging. It seemed to be a little bit disingenuous. Disappointment over the lost time to develop a back to school strategy as a new document from the school district points out problems with the government's school plans. A salmonella outbreak has sent some seniors to hospital. We'll have more coming up on Here and Now. Last weekend of August is here and it's going to end as a wet one. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We start tonight again with schools and education critics who are slamming government today in the wake of a leaked three month old report from the English school district and yet another document. Anthony, what can you tell us about it? Well, that's right, Carolyn. A lot of reaction to the May report that we divulged last night. Reaction from parents as well as politicians and the English school district revealed another letter that we didn't know about until now. After Here and Now reported on a back-to-school blueprint, the school district completed in May, it is no longer a secret, and you can now find it on the district's website. The English district also posted a letter written three weeks ago that exposes serious differences between what the district believes is critical and what the government is willing to accept. The August 7th letter is sent to then Education Minister Brian War, and it contains warnings. First, on physical distancing, the letter says, without additional human resources and infrastructure, we are unable to achieve physical distancing recommendations of one meter or two meters. Chief Medical Health Officer Janice Fitzgerald has been telling us for months that the science on social distancing is irrefutable. This letter says it's just not possible in St. John's and other urban area schools. Another problem area? Parents with immunocompromised children are simply going to keep their children at home out of concern. Others could do the same. And the district warns there is no contingency developed to provide learning opportunities to those students and families. There is a lot of student and parental angst about public exams. The province has resisted calls to cancel them, but the district says it would support an advanced decision to preemptively cancel public exams for the 2020-21 school year. Now, the letter also warns the department to get moving on finding more buses, something that we learned yesterday that the district had warned the government about back in May. Well, earlier today, I met with opposition education critics who aren't happy that the May plan was kept secret. PC MHA Craig Party says the current busing crisis might have been avoided. But I know of nobody that know they've got a seat on a school bus in the district of Bonavista or anywhere else. Uh, I've received lots of emails from uh, parents within Metro and they don't know. So I would say, uh, Anthony, quite likely there is nobody is aware that whether they have a seat on the bus or not because they depended on the administrations and the school systems and it's only now that they're they're back, but it's a big piece of work. I don't think it's realistic now to open schools on the 9th and know that every child in Newfoundland and Labrador are going to have access to a bus to school. I just don't think there's enough time left for that to be fulfilled. And that's not a surprise because I think the busing contractors would tell you the same thing. If they knew in May, they'd have a fighting chance in May, but it's not a given. Now, like Craig Party, the NDP's Jim Din is also a former teacher, and he says concealing the district's back-to-school blueprint while talking about collaboration was a serious blunder. Uh, I, I, had to, I got to wonder why uh, it's such a comprehensive document, and it's very clear that the district did its homework, that they laid out a very clear a number of scenarios, and they laid out clearly what they're going to need in resources, uh, I can't understand why this was, uh, why, why, the, uh, why the government sat on this for basically three, three and a half months, or, or four months really, and, uh, and said nothing about it and didn't have it out there for public discussion. Right now we're in a time crunch basically because of government's inaction, and uh, we're committed, I'm committed, to still finding the solutions, but please, no more, uh, I, I don't want to see any more of these documents that are held from us. Well, the leaked May report and now this August letter reveals a picture of discord between the government and the experts at the English school district. The government wanted schools open and all the students back in their classrooms to be plan number one. The district preferred a blended model of in-class and online learning from the get-go to free up some space to help deal with COVID. Now, the government's plan is what's set to roll out after Labor Day. Well, Education Minister Tom Osborne told us today that the blueprint from the district sent in May was, base, was based on the best 
available information at that time. The current back to school plan was developed with new information that's become available since then. Osborne was traveling today and we hope to have him on here and now next week. Dealing with COVID-19, there is another outbreak to tell you about, a salmonella outbreak. There are 27 cases of the potentially deadly infection in the province. More than a dozen cases are at a St. John's retirement home where three residents have been hospitalized with serious gastrointestinal symptoms. But it's not isolated there. Mark Quinn reports. A Tiffany Village official confirmed the outbreak. They say two of the three people who were hospitalized have come home and the third is expected to leave hospital today. It was a very upsetting time and again I, I go back to that it's upsetting for our residents. We're very close knit to them. We feel very close to our residents. They're like our own parents and grandparents. The retirement home started seeing symptoms in mid-August and salmonella was confirmed on August 19th. A total of 14 residents were diagnosed with the bacterial infection. Tiffany Village said provincial health officials are investigating, but it doesn't know the source of the salmonella yet. It's not the first salmonella outbreak at a retirement home in this province. There was another salmonella outbreak at a CBS facility last year. In that case, 34 people at the Admiral's Coast Retirement Centre in Kelligrews were infected. Some of them were also hospitalized. It's believed the source in that case was undercooked turkey. A Tiffany Village official told CBC News it's the first time they've had an outbreak of salmonella at the home. And they say the staff is working hard to make sure it's the last one. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, there is also one new case of COVID-19 in the province. According to the Department of Health, a female under the age of 19 was diagnosed with COVID-19 in the Eastern Health Region. Government says the case is related to international travel. The person is a resident of the province and had recently returned from Asia. While en route, she was asymptomatic. The department says upon her arrival, she followed public health guidelines and self-isolated contact tracing by public health officials is underway. Public health officials are also monitoring an incident at Five Wing Goose Bay. A person who recently spent a night at the base now tested for uh, po tested positive rather for COVID-19 while back in Ontario. Now that person was traveling on board a military plane from Europe to Trenton, but had an overnight stop at Five Wing Goose Bay. The person had close contact with several people on the base. They were all wearing PPE at the time. They've now been notified they have to self-isolate to monitor for symptoms. The MHA for the area, Perry Trimper, notified public health officials. Yesterday, uh, I became aware um, that uh, someone who has tested positive for COVID-19 who passed through Five Wing Goose Bay, I immediately reached out to uh, the Minister of Health and Community Services and uh, provincial officials uh, with the, um, the chief medical officer and they have in turn been in touch with the uh, with the wing to make sure that all uh, contact tracing, other precautions such as isolating the building and anyone who have been in contact are being followed. Well, ATV sales are up almost 150% since the pandemic. That's according to the head of the Trailway Council and Avalon Trailway Corporation. But despite two fatal ATV accidents in just one week, Rick Noseworthy says safety messages just aren't sinking in. An 18-year-old was found dead by the side of the highway between the south coast communities of St. Jack's and Valorum on Tuesday. A damaged ATV was found nearby. Now, the teenager was not wearing a helmet. Three days earlier, a 59-year-old man from Gambo was pinned under his ATV and later died in hospital. That makes nine ATV-related deaths this year, four in August alone. Noseworthy says it's time for communities to start speaking up happening within communities and everybody knows who's doing it and who, who the reckless riders are. And it's time to step up and start naming names. And also, be more respect. These machines are a lot of fun. They're rider active and you, you need to respect the power and you, know, you need to be confident on these machines. You need to wear your helmet at all times. You need to wear your seatbelt at all times. When on a side-by-side, 
you need to wear your helmet and your seatbelt at all times. It's all designed to work together and we need to be much safer. More of my conversation with Rick Noseworthy coming up later on Here and Now. Well, now to news from the courts. There will be no conclusions anytime soon in the trial for a school principal charged with assaulting children. Parents will have to wait until at least October to find out the fate of Robin McGraw. As the first two weeks come to a close, Ryan Cook brings us a look at what happened and what's still to come. October 26th, that's when we'll be back inside the courtroom for the second half of this trial. The Crown rested its case this morning after calling its seventh and final witness, a teacher who says she didn't see McGraw do anything criminal, but affirmed what other teachers have said, that Robin McGraw wanted to be in charge of discipline at his school. Throughout the trial, McGraw has sat stone-faced, listening to his former co-workers testify against him. They've said that he dragged a child into a cold shower, that he grabbed kids' faces and screamed at them, and that twice he stepped on a boy's hand when he wouldn't get off the floor. Lawyers for McGraw have tried to poke holes, pointing out professional and personal disagreements between McGraw and each of the seven witnesses, as well as other things like their fear of McGraw and how that could have colored their perceptions of what they saw. They really misjudged how much time was needed for this trial. They only set aside two weeks, which expired today, but there's still a lot left to go. When trial resumes, we'll hear from Robin McGraw himself, and he's expected to deny all the allegations by each of the seven women. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the 2020 pandemic and the 1992 COD moratorium, what do the two have in common? Well, more than you might think. Prajwala Dixit is exploring the relationship in a story that connects a fisherman from Bay Bowls with an artist in Nova Scotia. It's an iconic moment in Newfoundland Labrador history. Nearly 30 years ago in Bay Bowls, a showdown between the then fisheries minister John Crosby and hundreds of angry plant workers and fishermen. And then does not need to abuse me. You know? I'm not abusing I you. I didn't this. abuse you. I didn't take the fish from the goddamn water. Well, who took it? You, 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 you and your goddamn people took it. So where was 88-year-old Jean Maloney on the day the moratorium began? I was out on the water setting a cod trap. And when I come in, the wife said moratorium is on. No more fishing. That was the end of it. What was meant to be a temporary measure just two years is still in place three decades later. Jobs and livelihoods were lost, people forced to stay at home, not unlike today's pandemic. And like the COVID crisis, people took on new tasks at home, baking, gardening, and for Jean, during the moratorium, it was lawn care. I never knew we had grass on the land. <laughs> when I left in the morning, it was there. And a lot of the time I come home to dark. The front lawn must have got a surprise. <laughs> what kind of surprise? <laughs> that it was getting caught. <laughs> His income suddenly split in half, forcing him to pivot careers in 1992 to woodworking and boat building. Today, Nova Scotian artist Kat Miller finds herself in a similar situation. I sell artwork prints of my artwork. I sell cards, tea towels, uh, notebooks. So small, small things, easy, um, easy items that people can take home as souvenirs when they're traveling around the Maritimes. But because of the pandemic this year, I haven't had that busy summer season. CERB has definitely helped. It provided me with some stability thing is that, you know, it's, is it compensating for the sales that I've lost? No, but it's making sure that I can pay rent this month. Kat is using her current skills to pivot to a new project, one that interestingly enough involves Jean Maloney. Together with writer Jennifer Thornhill Verma, they're bringing alive his story for a new audience. I think Jean Maloney's story is important for a number of reasons made even more relevant during the current pandemic. But first and foremost, Northern Cod remains the greatest numerical reduction of a species in Canadian history. The Cod moratorium that happened July 2nd, 1992 was the largest mass industrial layoff in Canadian history as well. So 30, 40,000 Newfoundlanders and Labradorians at that time, that would have been at the time the equivalent of 600,000 Ontarians. And just to put that in 
perspective, during the current pandemic, we've had, you know, a couple million people, more than a couple million people put out of work. Many of those expect to return to work. That wasn't the case for Newfoundland and Labrador at the time. Gene's advice to those in the same boat he was years ago is simple. I had to find something to do. I was finished fishing, and I went to woodwork and then built boats and whatever. That's all, and I'm still at it. You get up in the morning, and you have something to do. But Why is that important, to have something to do? If not, you'll seize up. You park your car for six months, what happens? All the brakes, everything on her, seizes up. And then you get to go to the garage. If I don't come out here every day, I'll end up in a hospital somewhere, in a box or in something. <laughs> that kept me going after the moratorium. Prachvila Dikshit, CBC News, Babels. Now, before we go to break, a special note on behalf of our Here and Now family. Our beloved director, Rod Dobbin, is retiring after an incredible 38 years with the CBC. And for those of you who don't know, Rod is the calm, quiet voice in our ears each night. Yeah, and this is a man who genuinely loves coming to work every day after almost 40 years. And for a change, we're going to see him take us to break. You can see him right there from the control room. There he is, handsome, <laughs> handsome guy. And we're also going to share some retirement messages from your colleagues with the show. So let's take it away with your famous countdown, Mr. Dobbin.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Happy Friday, Ashley. <laughs> Happy Friday. <laughs> it's pretty nice out there today, some sunshine. It's a nice way to kick off the weekend. Yeah, kick off the last official weekend of August and you know I've been outside for a lot of days this uh, month really and it, it certainly is feeling like the weather is changing a little bit of a even though we hit 19 degrees today here in St. John's feeling a little chilly with that wind most certainly let's take a look at those temperatures across the board uh, high teens pretty much for most of the island 19 degrees in Badger and then we've got those single digit temperatures along the coast of Labrador seven degrees for Makovic and uh, eight for Hope Dale this afternoon. So that area of low pressure is still very much in play. We've been talking about it for a couple of days now. Uh, some periods of rain on the west coast. Otherwise, uh, just seeing some cloudy periods through the majority of the island. A few spits of rain earlier this afternoon, but overall a pretty lovely uh, afternoon and evening. But as we head through the overnight, the potential for some showers will stick around. Scattered, isolated showers uh, across the island and some periods of rain continuing for southeastern portions of Labrador as well as uh, through central and uh, areas in the west as well. That's pretty much the story uh, for the next 24 hours. We're looking at uh, temperatures overnight tonight around 12 degrees for St. John's. The winds will be gusty still, uh, anywhere from 40 to 50 kilometers per hour for the island, and then similar up through the big land. Seven degrees will be the overnight low in Nain. So your temperature's not moving too, too much, but uh, look at that temperature in Lab City, down to three degrees overnight. Now tomorrow, that area of low pressure will move offshore, which will basically just be cloudy periods through the day, but still can't rule out the chance of a few isolated showers or spits of rain through the day. Likely gonna stay cloudy for coastal areas of Labrador with the potential for some showers sticking around right through the afternoon. And then you'll see by overnight early morning hours is when we'll see the next system roll in. And that is the remnants of uh, what was Hurricane Laura. So temperatures tomorrow will be lovely again. Should be another 20 degree day for St. John's with some sunshine. Again, can't rule out the chance of a scattered shower, but the winds will stay up. So we're looking at westerlies anywhere from 40 to 50 kilometers per hour, at least in the first half of the day. And as the low moves off, the showers should, or the winds should actually die down just a little bit. Uh, eight degrees for Lab City uh, with some showers and same thing for Nain at uh, 10 degrees. So here is what the models are pointing at right now for Sunday morning into the afternoon. So you can see that rain, which is heavy at times. Now this is pretty much uh, typical of what we see when tropical systems roll through. However, there is a lot of discrepancy within the models just on where it's going to, the heaviest rain will be. And uh, that moves off and then we've got another low in behind it. So here's what my model is pointing at. This will fall through Monday afternoon and you can see that the heaviest rain at this point uh, at least this model this is the European model is showing anywhere from 50 to 70 millimeters of rain southern areas of potentially the Buren Peninsula as well as the Avalon could see more than that but it is important to pay attention to the forecast I'm more than likely going to see rainfall warnings but where this heavy rain falls is a little bit up for discussion at this point so just keep an eye on the forecast the winds will be brisk as well uh, we're looking at gusts potentially 50 to 70 kilometers per hour, a little bit higher for coastal areas. Again, completely depends on the track. Uh, 21 degrees will be the afternoon high for St. John's and a little bit cooler as you head towards the coast. Uh, 15 degrees in Gander, 16 in Corner Brook. But it does look like a nice day for most of Sunday for, the Lab for Labrador. 13 degrees for Cartwright and 11 for Lab City under cloudy skies. Now into Monday, things uh, get a little bit more unsettled for you in Labrador. So you're looking at those temperatures dipping again with the potential for some showers and then hovering around those same temperatures right across the island. On Tuesday, though, is when we'll see a little bit of a dip. It looks like we'll see a shift to northerly winds, and that'll drop the temperatures. And then into Wednesday, recovering beautifully with uh, some sunshine at this point. 
for both central and western Newfoundland, you'll notice just a little bit of a dip and then back up to that close to 20 degree mark by Wednesday with some sunshine and uh, rigid high pressure sets up. So it looks like we're in for a couple of nice days. Eastern Labrador, 19, 20 degrees for uh, the middle of next week and then some showers will move in for you for Lab West and 18 degrees. Wanted to share this lovely shot. Look at this waterfall and a view at Burnt Point. Uh, Jane Smith shared this lovely shot with us. And if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, probably from Saturday, because Sunday will be a washout, uh, send them to us. NL Photos at cbc.ca. Well, thanks, Ashley. We are starting to see the scope of the devastation left by Hurricane Laura in the southern U.S. At least six people died in Louisiana. Most of them were killed by trees that fell on their homes. The storm has weakened into a tropical depression, but it still brings the risk of tornadoes as well as heavy rains as it continues to move northeast. Cleanup and recovery efforts are now underway. The CBC's Steve D'Souza has more now from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Nowhere is the awesome force of Hurricane Laura more apparent than in this trailer park here in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which really took the brunt of the storm. You can see what the wind did to trailers like this, lifting it off its foundations, tearing apart the roof and siding. If you come around the corner here, you can see there is a hole in the side of the wall. A number of the trailers here, the windows are blown out. And what you see now is what people are coming back to today. Thousands of people evacuated, staying in hotels or with friends. And now they're coming back to pick up the pieces of their lives and finding that this is where those pieces end up in a pile. And, you know, we spoke with one couple, an elderly couple who came back to see what was left of their trailer and they found it simply wasn't livable anymore. It's just depressing in a way because we work so hard trying to keep things up. And this is worse than Rita. And uh, I, we didn't think it was going to be this bad, really. It's just devastating. We don't have no water, no electricity. I can't go in the bathroom and print. <laughs> At least you're keeping a good humor. <laughs> well, you have to keep your sense of humor or you'll go nuts. Many people are coming back to find their neighborhoods and the roads impassable because of all the fallen trees and the downed power lines. Hundreds of thousands in southwestern Louisiana are still without power and many parishes or neighborhoods are still without water. So that means for people who actually rode out the storm and survived the hurricane with minimal damage to their homes, they don't have power or water. So many, like a gentleman we spoke to earlier, are wondering if it's even worth staying after the hurricane. I'll never do it again. Um, you ever hear a banshee's howl? Because it sounded a lot like that. We got some old locks in the house and they got skeleton keyholes. And the wind going through it, it sounded like the most high pitched whistle, scream, howl thing you've ever heard. The cleanup and the recovery really just getting underway here. And the question for many people is about relief, is about insurance. Will they have money to get through? But people here tell us that they are resilient. They've been through this before with Hurricane Rita in 2005. So even when you see a site like this, they say they will be able to get through it. They will be able to work together because they've done it before. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Roddy, congratulations on a well-deserved retirement. You know, above and beyond is, is really a great way to describe you, not just at work, but outside of work. I remember when my hot water tank kicked it. I came to you looking for advice in terms of which brand to purchase. Well, not only did you go and pick it up, deliver it at the house, you then informed me you had a crew coming to install it. Well, sure enough, the crew showed up. It was you and your father. And boy, was that fun watching him tell you what to do for an hour around the basement. Uh, I'll always uh, remember that fondly. Now, I just wish you all the very, very best uh, to you, Leanne and PJ, all the very, very best and congratulations again. And I hope that we'll uh, see you soon.
In less than a week, this province has seen two ATV deaths. On Tuesday, an 18-year-old ATV driver was found dead on the south coast. Three days before that, a 59-year-old from Gambo was found pinned under an ATV and later died in hospital. Now, those deaths are only two out of a total of nine ATV deaths in this province this year, a number that is alarming to safety expert Rick Noseworthy. He joins us from his cabin on the Savonier line. Mr. Noseworthy, why do you think we're seeing such a high number of people killed on ATVs? Well, a lot of it is error. You know, there's no such thing as an accident, of course. Uh, they all happen for a reason. But there's a lot more traffic this year. Uh, people are at home. Uh, sales are up 147%. So there's certainly a lot of operators. But uh, I, I don't know what else, Carolyn. Uh, there's certainly been a you know, nine is nine too many. The sales for ATVs are up 147% this year? Yes, ATV sales are up 147% since the pandemic. That seems like a lot. It certainly is. Actually, many of the dealers across the province now are having trouble getting stock in. Uh, sales would probably even be up on the, um, all across Canada. Now it's hard to get the ATVs. So do you think more people are using ATVs? Certainly, it could be a reason. There's a lot of people not working from home. There's probably just as many ATVs going on the road and abusing the road. As, but now there's more people home that are, are actually seeing them. How does this year compare to past years when it comes to ATV deaths? Is nine an unusually high number? Well, it certainly seems like it to me. From the, what I can figure and what I've heard and like working with the RCMP, I think last year there was three or four. So this year it's nine. So that is a lot. And, you know, we're only in the, the end of August. What do you think needs to change to reduce the high number of people being killed on these machines? I think people have to be more responsible. They have to be responsible to themselves, to their families, to their community. There's a lot of this happening within communities, and everybody knows who's doing it and who, who the reckless rockers are. And it's time to step up and start naming names. And also, be more respect. The, these machines are a lot of fun. But they're rider active, and you, you need to respect the power. And, you know, you need to be confident on these machines. You need to wear your helmet at all times. You need to wear your seatbelt at all times. When on a side-by-side, -side, you need to wear your helmet and your seatbelt at all times. It's all designed to work together, and we need to be much safer. As I mentioned, the latest death involved an 18-year-old. A lot of young people enjoy riding ATVs, but what needs to happen to make sure younger ATV drivers are kept safe? Well, what needs to happen there, the parents need to be more responsible. There's a thousand ways we could say it, but the problem is, it, the problem is not kids. Kids don't own these. There's no 15-year-old or 14-year-old can go out and spend $15,000 per machine. Somebody is providing those machines, and the people that are providing those machines need to be more accountable. Rick Noseworthy, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about this. Well, thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity. Hi, it's Glenn from my deck. Look, it was great working with you. It's hard to believe that you're going after 35 years. You're, what are you, like 42, 43 years old? Even the stressful times, you seem to always have a smile on your face. You made other people around you relax. I could always go to you and say, suggest something that I wanted to do. You're always eager to make something happen, even if it, even if it was uh, difficult. And it, was, it, it really was a pleasure working here with you. You were just one of those guys. So enjoy your retirement. My best to you and your family. I hope you have great things ahead. So this is Glenn Payette, CBC News, from his deck in St. John's.
Welcome back. Well, if you've been scrolling through social media lately, you may have seen a special shot of Signal Hill. This one more miniature and made of building blocks. As here now's Jeremy Eaton explains, it may not be the last local landmark to get the Lego treatment. Cabot Tower in St. John's is one of the most iconic landmarks in all of Newfoundland and Labrador. It's also one of the windiest, but seeing it wasn't good enough for one local man. He decided to build his own out of Lego. Somebody said that it was impossible to do the octagonal uh, tower out of square bricks. And, and I said, well, I think I could do the tower. And they said, well, even if you could tower, you probably won't figure out how to do the, the corners. To pull off this build, you'd think Churchill was a lifelong Lego lover. He says he only got into it about 10 years ago when he started building Star Wars stuff. His collection now consists of about 100,000 different blocks. He's also become the president of a very active Lego builders group for grown-ups. The Newfoundland Labrador Lego Users Group. We're what's called an R-Log, which is a registered Lego users group. We have uh, the backing and authority of Lego. Uh, Lego supports us in our day-to-day uh, -day operations by sending us uh, free sets and allowing us to occasionally buy uh, Lego, Lego bricks at, at a discount. That group has done some impressive things. Wes Saunders' Mario, Barbara Ann Gian's Enterprise, and this from John Gillingham. One of our members has built a nine-foot model of the Ocean X Conagra, which is the container ship which supplies St. John's. Uh, that's a monster. That's about 100,000 pieces in just that build. The Cabot Tower build wasn't a quick turnaround. About six months uh, time. Uh, obviously, I have a full-time job. Probably between 20 and 40 hours. I actually had the thing completely finished. And then last Christmas, I designed the Christmas star. And when I went to mount the new star on Cabot Tower, I discovered I had the windows completely wrong on the side that the tower goes on. Which meant tearing down the wall and rebuilding. He uses a specialized computer program to guide him. Basically, that software allows me to build brick by brick in the software, specify the colors that are available so I can make sure I'm not building with a, a part that's not available in a particular color. And I can uh, put it together. And so I know when I, at the end of it, I have a theoretically buildable model. A Lego build is like a lot of pieces of art. It's very difficult to say when it's finished. I don't consider Cabot Tower finished right now. It's a great build. I've got more parts coming that I intend to make it better. As for what's next? I've talked about uh, maybe something big like the Basilica. I have a rough design for the Basilica, and it's probably going to come in around 12,000 bricks. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. now that we're six months into this pandemic and restrictions have eased, many Canadians are traveling again, perhaps to university or for an end of summer vacation. Today, Canada's chief public health officer was asked about staying safe on planes, which are often packed with people. Not mixing passengers, try to sit very still, everyone facing in the same direction, seat back in front of you, mask wearing, hand hygiene, a layers of protection. Can we guarantee 100% protection? No, but it's many different layers of protection to reduce the risk. And I think, um, again, we haven't had a report in Canada of someone who acquired it during a flight. Meanwhile, Ottawa has extended a ban that bars entry to those who are not Canadian citizens, permanent residents, or people entering from the United States for essential reasons. It was set to expire at the end of August. Now it stands until at least the end of September. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rod. Here we are in a studio just set to go on the air this morning, but I want to take a couple of minutes and join the group of people wishing you well in your retirement. I've been to St. John's and to Newfoundland so many times over the years, thinking back elections and, of course, the Cougar crash, uh, so many Memorial Days and Canada Days, most recently for the funeral of John Crosby. And as I said, you've always been right there with your team. 
you're always so professional. Everyone there is so kind and so much fun. And I love to come to St. John. So I will miss very much my return if you're not part of it. But I thank you for everything over the years. I wish you well. Best wishes, Rod. Well, let's find out who's celebrating. Happy 52nd anniversary to Frank and Doris White of Brown's Arm. Happy 52nd anniversary as well to John and Kathy Hewitt in Grand Falls, Windsor. And wishing Betty and Barry Noble of Jack's Fontaine a happy 51st anniversary. Congratulations to Roy and Eva Bennett of Norman's Cove who are celebrating their 59th anniversary. And congrats to Evelyn and Reg Reddick of Herring Neck. They are celebrating their 50th anniversary. 51st anniversary greetings going out to Bill and Pearl Jenkins of Summerford. Wishing Ron and Nora Kelly of Freshwater, now living in Placentia Junction, a happy 59th anniversary. Sandy and Laverne Campbell of Charlottetown, Labrador are celebrating their 54th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Happy anniversary to Kevin and Viola Gillingham of Noggin Cove, who are celebrating 50 years of marriage. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Alan and Shirley Poole of 
Milltown, now living in Bishop's Falls. 52nd anniversary greetings going to Ethel and Richard Park of Gillum's Bay of Islands. Ellen and Andrew Saunders of Gambo are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary and a happy 65th anniversary to Stan and Dorothy Murphy of Kilbride. Happy 56th anniversary to Henry and Gladys Payne from St. Paul's. Happy 54th wedding anniversary to Gordon and Francis Whiffen of Southern Harbor. Happy 68th wedding anniversary going out to Don and Ruby Bragg of Pilly's Island. Mary and Joe Power of Shea Heights are celebrating 50 years of wedded bliss. Congratulations. Happy 55th anniversary to Maynard and Mary Upshaw of Little Harbor East Placentia Bay. Happy 72nd anniversary to Chesley and Sadie Burry. Happy 50th anniversary to Jean and Gordon Smith. And happy 63rd anniversary to Hazen and June Walters of Gander. Happy 58th anniversary to Garland and Margaret Foss from Bay Vert. And congratulations to Lloyd and Vera Bennett of Cornerbrook, now living in Clarenville. They're celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary. Wendell and Helen Forward of Clarenville, now in Stittsville, Ontario, are celebrating their 50th anniversary. And Jerry and Lorraine Heffernan from Mount Pearl, also celebrating 50 years together. Another golden anniversary, happy 50th to Donald and Catherine Hustons. Carl and Marjorie Moores of Grand Falls, Windsor, celebrating 60 years of marriage. Congratulations. Happy 50th anniversary to Arthur and Louise of Gambo. Bill and Sheila Gujou of St. John's are celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary. They're the parents of two of our colleagues here at CBC, John and Lisa. Congratulations. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Russell and Sandra Park of Gillums. Happy 58th anniversary to George and Bernice Clements of Bonavista. Clifford and Louisa Mitchell of Robert's Arm are celebrating their 61st anniversary. And now some birthdays, a very happy 90th birthday to Gwen Follett in Grand Bank. 90th birthday wishes going out to Stephen Coffin from Fogo Island and wishing Gerard Feltham of Globertown a happy 92nd birthday. Birthday greetings going out to Laura Moore of Clarks Beach. It's her 93rd birthday tomorrow. Happy 91st birthday to Daphne Blackwood of Grand Falls, Windsor. Melita Barnes is celebrating her 96th birthday today. She's from Coombs Cove and now lives in Lewisport. Happy birthday to Marjorie Noseworthy. She's turning 95. Happy 90th birthday to Annie Brennan of Marystown. She still bakes bread every day. Okay, I'll take a loaf. Every week, I'll, actually, I'll not take, every day. I'll take a loaf. <laughs> Best wishes as well to Margaret Barrett of Old Perlican, who's celebrating her 92nd birthday. Happy 93rd birthday to Marie Wheaton of Fredericton NL, now living in Gander. Happy birthday to Joan Costello of Fairland, who is celebrating her 95th birthday. Day. And birthday greetings as well to James Squires of Burlington, who is 92 years old today. And happy 91st birthday greetings to Gladstone Best of Wesleyville, celebrating this coming Monday. Happy birthday to Doris Snow of St. John's. She turned 91 yesterday. Happy 93rd birthday to Mary Malloy of Tours Cove. Happy 95th birthday to Roy Fudge, who's living in Grand Falls, Windsor, and celebrated last Sunday. Happy 93rd birthday to Isaac Chambers, who's celebrating tomorrow in Flowers Cove. Happy 99th birthday birthday to Ellen Rose Leonard of St. Leonard's, Placentia Bay, and a happy 90th birthday to Marjorie Green in Grand Bank. Another fine crowd, congratulations once again. And speaking of congratulations, as we mentioned earlier in the show, and you've no doubt noticed from all those retirement messages we've been sharing, it's a really big day for our Here and Now family. Mm -hmm. After almost four decades, our longtime show director, Rod Dobbin, is retiring tonight. Started way back in Labrador, I guess before child labor laws existed in the country. <laughs> it's hard to sum up what an incredible impact that this guy's had over the years. So we put a little something together. So Mr. F, Mr. Dobbin, Roddy, you mind just uh, pressing play, please? Turn her all on for the last time. After an incredible 38 years with the CBC, here and now's beloved director, Rod Dobbin, is retiring. Now, you at home may not know Rod, but at CBC NL, he's a star player, the star player. Rod works tirelessly, and he's done that for decades, behind the scenes in radio, as a cameraman, and in our control room. He is the calm, steady voice in our ears, guiding us through the show each and every night. His thoughtfulness and dedication to storytelling is award-winning. 
This story about Cliff Oldford won a photography award. Oldford was an elderly man from Musgrave Town who was swindled out of his home but managed to get it back. The cameraman was Rod Dobbin. The judges said his photography was skillful and he captured images that stuck with viewers. And Cliff Oldford had a story to tell and had known to tell it to until we arrived on his doorstep. And I think we've got a little bit of justice to uh, an elderly man. But thank you very much for this. Rod's stellar reputation reaches far beyond our building. He was recruited for five Olympic Games. Sydney, Athens, to Reno, Beijing, and who could forget, Nagano. Well, Rod, I know you've never been to that part of the world before. What are your impressions? Well, the, the people, I guess, is uh, mostly, Debbie, the people are very friendly, much like home, and uh, they can't do enough for you. And Rod, some of the food over there is pretty exotic. What have you been brave enough to try? <laughs> well, uh, I, I've been sticking to uh, McDonald's mostly, but, I, but we went out for, uh, for a feed of sushi one night, and I just could not eat it. It hadn't stopped moving, had it? No, it's still blinking, and I, I don't think I'll, uh, I'll try anything that blinks at me. It's that fun, that fearlessness, and unfailing positivity that makes Rod the man you want leading your team during a high-stakes show. He's guided us through countless telethons, leadership conventions, elections. It only happens every four years. The provincial election comes along, and our team here at CBC switches into high gear. Well, I normally have a lot of stress every night, even when we do here and now on a, on a regular, on a nightly basis. But tonight, I say it's cranked up about tenfold. This is the biggest production that this operation has done in the past four years. We have six cameras in our studio, which we normally don't have. We have four live remotes. We have a crew here from Toronto to come in to help us pull this off. And every CBC employee in Newfoundland and Labrador are out tonight working so that we could have a show that people will never forget. But beyond his many successes, Rod is the ultimate team player. Constantly mentoring and supporting all of his colleagues, meeting the most stressful of circumstances with a great sense of humor and a can-do attitude. Happy retirement, Rod, from your here and now family. And to borrow one of your favorite lines, Perfect job. Perfect, perfect, perfect. That That's, sums him up. Yeah, it perfectly. sure does. And I, I'm not sure if it's just me, Cam, but it's like even as time gave him wisdom wrinkles, the mustache kind of stayed the same for 40 years. So <laughs> that's a, a, bit of his magic, a bit of his magic. A bit of his magic. It's amazing watching him talking about how we do election shows and all that. I know that we're going to have an election uh, within the next 12 months. I'm sort of thinking totally selfishly. I, I can't imagine doing election night without Rod here. Yeah, even though you saw those shots from uh, the snowmageddon night and he was out in the, the loading bay just shoveling all the snow so we could scoot in there and try to broadcast live uh, yeah. out there. He's, uh, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, uh, now, I gotta say, we, we managed to sort of not burst into tears for the, for the show, <laughs> which is a good thing, which is a good thing, but I, I do want to sort of challenge uh, Rod, so if uh, you're out and about and you see Rod, ask him, what was Anthony showing that, that night? Because Rod taught me a very important thing about this box that we use. Um, is that ask, the box we ask, stand on? For, for some of the people who are height challenged, as we put it, we let them stand on this box. And Rod had some excellent advice how to be on TV when you stand on this box. So if you bump into Rod when you're out in retirement, just ask him, ask him about the wisdom of the box. It will uh, produce uh, some sort of interesting answer for you. Now, I will say on a less flippant point, if you work in a place and you know there's that person who's always positive and no matter how bad a day you're having, that's Rod. Yeah. So that calm, reassuring voice in our ears every night. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> He's telling us to glue it up. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't want that's us it, to talk about it, him anymore. <laughs> but what we're going to do uh, as we end our show, Rod always counts things down for us. And I don't want to leave him hanging, but we've got 10 seconds, so yep. thanks, Count Roddy. Count us out, Roddy.